All right, it's about that time. So uh, welcome back from lunch, everybody. Uh, for the first speaker after lunch in this session is Arshad, who's working, uh, working excuse me, with uh, Professor Mark Wilde at LSU. So you're already sharing your screen. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I want to thank the organizers, first of all, to, uh, for having me. Uh, for this very nice quilt day. All right, so I will start. Please feel free to stop me whenever you'd like. All right, so I wanna to talk to you about the research that I've been doing um, for the last year with uh, Mark and in collaboration also with Francesco, which is on the efficiency fidelity trade-off in a uh, quantum error correcting engine. So let's go ahead. Um, I wanna start with simple motivation. So all of us know that qubits are used for computations. And we also know that um, uh, typically, there is a noise associated with the, any computation, and that noise can be um, can lead to unwanted errors in the qubits. So, a question, which is a pretty simple question to ask, is that uh, well, how do you protect the qubits against such unwanted noise? Right. Um, now, one way to answer this question is through something called an error quantum error correction. So specifically, quantum error correction will be able to protect qubits against known sources of noise. So uh, on the right-hand side, you can see a simple scheme of it. Uh, this is the Shor code. Uh, it's one of the most uh, well-known codes in error correction. So given that one can use quantum error correction, if you look into how error correction works, you can see that the scheme resembles that of a heat engine uh, which is a well-known concept in thermodynamics that operates with a feedback controller. So through this link between thermodynamics and error correction, one can immediately ask the question of whether thermodynamics can put any limitations on the fidelity of error correction, right? And that's the question that we explore in this research. Now, a take-home message will be the following answer, which is that yes, thermodynamics can put limitations. And in, a, in its most simplified form, you can think of it as a efficiency and fidelity trade-off. All right, so with this motivation set, um, I want to first introduce you to error correction in a very simple way. So let's first start with classical error correction. Now, assume that I have a bit, right? A classical bit, which can be either, either zero or one. And let's say you know that there is going to be some error, some bit flip error with probability p onto this uh, classical bit. Now, given this knowledge, can we preempt um, this bit flip error? So this is one kind of a question that error correction is interested in. Um, turns out the answer is yes, and you can do it through something called the majority voting method. Um, if you'd like to go into more detail about um, error correction, by the way, I highly suggest uh, Nelson and Chuang's book on quantum computations. But for now, let me give you a simple, um, uh, a simple way to understand majority voting. So what you do is that you um, add in two ancillary bits into your initial bit. So now you have, now we have three bits instead of one. So why do you do this? You do this to add redundancy. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, you encode a logical zero and a logical one using three bits rather than one. So this is where the redundancy come in. So the logical zero is encoded by three zeros onto your three bits, the one original bit that you had and the two ancillary bits, the same for the logical one, right? So while doing this, uh, you can consider possible errors. So you can have two types of, uh, well, if you start from triple zero, for example, and um, a bit flip error happens with probability P, you're gonna get one of these three results, right? Either a bit flip in the first bit or the second bit or the third bit. The same thing happens if you encode with ones, right? Now, the important thing to notice is when you use those two ancillary qubits or the two ancillary bits, those two subsets are, are disjoint. So you can distinguish between an error that happened, um, between, an, between an error on the encoding with the zero and the error with an encoding on the one because they don't share any such uh, uh, similar outcomes, right? So that's the important thing to note here. That's why uh, you uh, put a redundancy in your system. So final thing to do is that you measure, of course, uh, what the measurement, what the outcome is of the um, uh, of the noisy channel, let's say. 
and then you decode. So the decoding could be, for example, if you obtain this result, the 100, you would reinterpret it as being a 000. That's what the decoding means. And in this way, you can actually fix uh, a single bit uh, error uh, via this procedure. This is called the majority voting method. So you can generalize this quantum error correction um, in a very similar way. So let's say, uh, well, one thing to note, first of all, is that in quantum, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, errors can be continuous onto the bit. So uh, the qubit can have um, not only a bit flip error, but also a, other errors like phase flip errors or like a uh, uh, or like a rotations in the uh, block sphere, and those are all continuous. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Whereas in classical um, error correction, a bit flip is only discrete. There's only an error that can take a zero from take a state from zero to one or one from or from one to zero. So that's a big distinction. Now there are so this means that there are much more uh, a continuum of uh, more errors in error correction in the quantum case versus the classical case. Now, at least if we, if you want to discuss the bit flip error, and I want to start from there, um, you can apply the same idea. So for the bit flip channel, for example, uh, the quantum way in which you can describe the bit flip error, you see something like this, right? This is your channel with probability one minus p, nothing will happen. And with probability p, you'll have a bit flip, right? Um, again, you can apply the majority voting. Uh, this case with the qubits, but the idea is the same. So with this said, now, of course, we have to uh, worry about what to do when, the, uh, when you get any other error except for the bit flip error, right, in the quantum case. So that's the big question. Now, initially, it might seem like a hopeless task uh, to correct a continuum of errors, but it turns out it's possible in a surprisingly simple way. Now, the way to see this, first of all, to note that you can correct not only a bit flip error, but a phase flip error. So why can you correct a phase flip error? The reason is because for the phase flip error, uh, which is written in this form, where you have the Pauli sigma z's, rather the Pauli sigma x's, this is a bit flip error in the plus and minus basis, not the computational basis. So this realization makes you um, be able to correct phase flip errors in the same way you correct bit flip errors in the plus minus spaces. Now, if you're talking about a more general kind of error, you can always represent it in the block representation for a single qubit, right, which is given in this form. Here you have the poly matrices with the corresponding coefficients. And at least for sigma x, you know that um, it's going to be a bit flip error. And for sigma z, you know it's going to be a phase flip error, both of which you know how to correct. So what's remaining is the sigma y, but you can write down sigma y as the product of the Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma z. And hence, sigma y can be interpreted as a bit flip and a phase flip error. So with this said, you can interpret uh, an arbitrary error onto your single qubit as a linear combination of a bit flip, phase flip, and a concatenation of bit flip and phase flip errors. So with, the, with this realization, you can correct arbitrary um, um, errors on, on the uh, qubit. And this is, this is the realization that has been had by uh, Shore in his uh, nine qubit code. All right, so this is a simple introduction to error correction and why it's relevant. Now, I wanna move ahead and talk about how you can see error correction or specifically quantum error correction as linked to thermodynamics uh, via uh, interpreting it as a heat engine with a feedback control by making the following comparison. So in the case of quantum error correction, of course, you have a noisy channel to deal with or to correct. Now, in the thermodynamic case, that can correspond to having a hot reservoir or a hot bath uh, that is interacting with your system. Uh, in error correction, also, what you want to do is you want to recycle the ancillary system, right? Uh, the ancillary qubits in, or the bits that you use, you always want to recycle them to want to use them in a future error correction procedure, um, which in the thermodynamic sense can be done by interacting with a cold reservoir. Um, also, for quantum error correction, there's, of course, their detection and the decoding stages, which look like a feedback control. Um, in, in the context of a um, thermo in the context of thermodynamics. So th through this link between 
or this like tenuous relationship between error correction and uh, heat engines with feedback controls, you can see that one might be able to come up with a statement in thermodynamics that can um, have a rippling effect in error correction. That's the question we consider. We consider whether thermodynamics can put such a, uh, whether it can put such a limitation or not. Turns out the answer is yes. Um, before I go any deeply though, I do wanna discuss what it means uh, or how do we quantify information gain? Because that's an important part of error correction. And it's gonna appear also in, uh, in the uh, second law of thermodynamics as, as we shall see. So let me talk briefly about that. So the formalism that we use is called something called the quantum instrument formalism, where let's say you have a measurement outcome uh, Y from a set of possible measurement outcomes, big Y. Uh, the formalism describes this as uh, your state, which is the pre-measurement state, goes post-measurement becomes rho as a function of the measurement outcome, which is described in the following way, where NY is a completely positive trace non-increasing map. Um, so it can, since it's completely positive, it can be written in this way for each measurement outcome, right? This is the Krauss representation. Um, of course, the sum over these channels, the completely positive trace non-increasing maps has to be a completely positive trace preserving map. The reason for that is you wanna conserve the probabilities if you sum over the measurement outcomes. So this is how the formalism looks like um, for the quantum instrument formalism, which is what we use in, in, in this research, um, in this research article. So how do you describe measure the information gain then? Well, you describe it using something called a, or a quantity called a Grenewald information, which describes the reduction in the entropy uh, of the system. Uh, this is the initial entropy of the system, right? With the initial state right here. And this is the average final entropy of the system. Uh, this is the final state post measurement, given the outcome Y, and this is the average over all the measurement outcomes. PY are the probabilities and are given by the trace of this trace of NY rho. It's this denominator right here. So this is the Grenewald information and it's uh, typically used to describe information gain. Now it has some problems in the sense that it can be negative uh, for certain measurement outcomes uh, or for certain, certain, um, certain measurements, let's say, and that can be misinterpreted, uh, sorry, that can, be, that can be hard to interpret because uh, you think of the Grenewald information as the information gain. So if your information gain is negative, that kind of doesn't make sense. You always want it to be positive since you expect to gain something from a measurement, gain information specific. Right, so um, however, given that Grenewald information can be negative, uh, which is hard to interpret, it is positive for efficient measurements, which is something very important to, to state. So by efficient measurements, I mean that those, um, those channels uh, can be written as only via only a single Krauss operator. Now, generally there are a sum of Krauss operators, but if it, you can write it down as, as a single Krauss operator, then that's an efficient measurement. And for efficient measurements, it's always positive, uh, which means it's easy to give meaning to as, the, uh, as an information gain quantity. All right, so with this set, I can finally go uh, more in depth into the relation between error correction and thermodynamics. So specifically, this is how I wanna describe uh, error correction. Um, so take a look at the following uh, diagram. So you start with a system and you have, an, you have a system that you wanna protect the state of against noise. You have an ancillary system, which is gonna be used to um, duplicate the information in the system and you're gonna encode it. So what you're gonna do is that uh, you're gonna make S and A, those two systems interact unitarily and that's going to be the encoding stage. Uh, hence, you'll be preparing them for the next step, which is going to be where they interact with the noisy environment or the noise source. In this case, it's going to be the hot bathroom. Um, so they interact with the hot bath and there's some heat exchange that happens. And then afterwards, of course, since they pass through the noisy channel, you get to decode them. So the decoding is done through two steps. First, you measure. Uh, you do an error center measurement to detect what kind of errors have been made. And you do a feedback based on what kind of errors you detect, right? So uh, that's the typical procedure in the decoding stage. 
Now, after decoding, you would like to get uh, the system state as close as possible to the initial state, which is the whole point. But also you have the ancilla, which is not exactly the same initial state. And you want to recycle it back so that you can use it in a future state. So what you do is that you make it interact with the cold path so that it will bring it back to its initial state. Right? And again, the goal is to have the final state of the system as close as possible to the initial state. Now, to describe this in uh, detail, to discover how the engine works in detail, uh, this is a circuit representation of how it does, what it does. So you have your system and the ancilla. This is a more detailed representation of what I just showed you. So system and the ancilla, you first purify the system for reasons I will specify soon. So first, so you have your system and the ancilla, and um, what you do initially uh, is that you prepare your ancilla in a pure state by making a projective measurement in the energy basis. You uh, save the measurement outcome in a classical register. And then you use that measurement outcome to do the encoding uh, between the system and the ancilla. Right? And then after the encoding is done, you make it interact with the noise source, which is going to be the hot path described right here, prepared in a thermal state on the left. And this interaction is unitary. So after the interaction, um, you want to decode what has happened. So you send those two systems to a decoding stage where you apply your measurement. And this is where the quantum instrument formalism uh, comes in. Now, the measurement is done based on the classical uh, outcome of the classical register. So outcome of the initial measurement of stage x. So there's a, there's a feedback happening right here where you're feeding back the classical information. Um, you're also recording the outcome of, the sec of this error syndrome measurement by using a second classical register, which I denote by Y, right? And that is also an input here. So after the error syndrome measurement is made, you carry on the measurement outcome through the second classical register, and you use it along with the first measurement outcome in order to do a decoding stage, right? Which is also another unitary on the system and then similar. And at the end, uh, hopefully you'll get a, a system state that's as close as possible to the initial state. And for the ancilla, as I said before, you recycle it. So you make it interact with a cold path. And um, if you start with an ancilla in initially thermal state, you will get the ancilla back in that thermal state if this, uh, if this uh, uh, recycling state is, um, if this recycling unitary um, leads to a, uh, a fully thermalizing state as it does here. And at the end, of course, you erase the memory of the classical registers because you don't need them anymore. So this is how the engine works in detail. Now, you can do a um, entropic analysis of what's happening here at each state. And if you uh, just do the calculations, uh, at the end, you'll end up with an inequality, uh, which is going to be the generalization of the second law in the case of an error correcting engine. Um, which the terms of which I'm going to describe right now. So on the left-hand side, you can see something which is very familiar. Uh, it's the entropy dissipated from the system into the, uh, sorry, from the reservoirs into the system where QH and QC are the hot and are the heat uh, dissipated from the hot and the cold reservoirs respectively. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a collection of terms. So each of these terms has a specific meaning. For example, on the right-hand side, the first term is, uh, the entropy change of the system. Um, and I'm saying the entropy change because the initial entropy is zero since you purified your system state. So the change is equal to the final entropy. So this is the entropy change. And if you restrict yourself to this term alone, you already know what the inequality means. It's Clausius's inequality, which, is, which you're very familiar with. Um, you can see it, for example, for a Carnot engine. Uh, or any other engine with two, with, with two heat paths, with a hot path and a cold path. So this part you're familiar with. Now, the next term is what you will have if you also include a measurement step when you're operating your engine. And this is where you have your average information gain uh, because IG is the Grenoble information that we talked about earlier. So, this is a term that you would see. In fact, if you look into the literature, you would see it in 2008. This has been done by Sagawa and Yuda, where they discussed a heat engine with a feedback control. This is the second term that arises for them that doesn't exist for Clausius's inequality. Uh, and that's what you will get here when you do the calculations. 
uh, the average, of course, is done over the initial uh, over the initial uh, preparations uh, as the expectation over the initial preparations of the insulin. Uh, so there are two more terms though here uh, in comparison to what we had in this paper by Sagawanuda. The third term is the entropy reduction that happens when you discard uh, the classical registers X and Y. And this is the entropy reduction because this mutual information takes its maximum value when E, the system E is the whole engine excluding the classical register. So every component in the engine but the classical registers is what E is. So if this mutual information is maximized, then uh, this term is zero. And this mutual term is maximized, mutual information term is maximized uh, when you can completely recover the information about X and Y from the state of the rest of the engine E. And um, that's why it describes uh, the entropy reduction uh, from, discard from discarding X and Y. So this is the third term. The fourth term describes the entropy transfer to your uh, classical register Y uh, after the measurement uh, after the measurement has been made. So that's that's the fourth term. So each of these terms has a physical meaning here. Um, the last two terms, of course, you don't see them in literature. It's it's it. Uh, it has to do with the detailed analysis that we did here. Also, it's important to note that uh, although I haven't mentioned this before, but um, the analysis done here are more general than the one that has been done in this paper by Sagawa Newton. So the result that they obtained is actually something that can be generalized. All right, so how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Uh, all right, so now with this said, this is, this is one of the main results of uh, our, of our, our um, paper. Um, now, what you can do with this is that you can actually put it in use and uh, make a statement about uh, the fidelity of the error correction that is being done by this quantum error correcting engine in terms of thermodynamic quantities. So to do that though, I have to introduce two important quantities that I'm gonna use. So there are the fidelity and the efficiency. Um, so let's start with the fidelity. So the basic idea of, to describe what fidelity is, the basic idea of quantum error correction is that if you have an initial state of the system, and it goes through a noisy channel, then uh, a quantum error correction has to bring has to do an additional operation on this on this noisy output to bring it to a final state which is as close as possible to the initial state. Right. So if you want to discuss uh, the success of this operation, the quantum error correction operation, you can talk about it in terms of the fidelity between the initial and the final states. So uh, fidelity for uh, those of you who are unfamiliar. So fidelity is one when those two uh, states are equal to each other. And it becomes zero when those are uh, as far away from each other in, in some sense. So you can, discuss, you can describe uh, the success of quantum error correction by using this quantity called fidelity. Uh, now, remember, you want it to be as close as possible to one. But if you introduce something called entanglement fidelity, which is the fidelity after you have purified your initial system state, right? Um, then, now, the purification, of course, is uh, given by this formula. Then you can uh, say, and this is a very well-known result, is that uh, this fidelity that you're looking for is, in fact, lower bounded by the entanglement fidelity. So in some sense, you can actually worry about the entanglement fidelity and forget about this one that we initially introduced. And that's what people do in uh, the error correction literature. So that's the one term, that's the one quantity that we're gonna be using. Uh, it's called the entanglement fidelity. Uh, and the second quantity, of course, is gonna be the efficiency of our error correcting engine. So the efficiency, no surprise, is uh, given by uh, the work done divided by the uh, heat absorbed by the hot bath, or in this case, it's our noise source. But of course, there's a big difference uh, in comparison to typical car no engine, which is that here the work done includes the work done by the uh, measurement apparatus onto our system. So it's not just the work done in the encoding and the decoding stages. Um, just for completeness sake, also the heat, the total heat dissipated in this process is the sum of the following terms. So this is for the hot bath, right? Uh, this is the heat from the cold bath. This is the heat generated in the measurement stage. And this is the heat dissipated in the erasure 
or the discarding of the classical registers. Right, so those are the uh, two terms that we're gonna, or the two concepts that we're gonna use. Now, with these two definitions, you can formulate something as, uh, as straightforward as an uh, if trade-off statement between efficiency and fidelity, which follows from the following assumptions. So the clauses or the, or the generalized second law that we derived, uh, if you make the assumption first that the temperature is sufficiently low, specifically it has to be lower than this right-hand side where uh, dA and dy are the uh, Hilbert space dimensions of your ancillary system and your uh, classical register or the memory that you're using to report the measurement outcomes. Uh, if the, so if the th temperature is small enough and if your measurements are efficient, hence your Grenewald information is positive, uh, then you can make a trade-off statement, which is given by the following. So um, first of all, just, just to make a comparison between the result I'm gonna show you and what is known, uh, it's been known that um, for engines with feedback controllers, unlike Carnot engines, you can actually surpass the Carnot band uh, or, the Car or the Carnot efficiency. So this is something that has been known, as I mentioned before from, by this paper from Sagawa Nuda. Uh, what we show is that uh, as a consequence of the inequality that we derived, if you operate in the super Carnot efficiency regime, your fidelity of error correction is going to suffer. So it's going to be below one. One is the ideal case that you want. And if you want the ideal case to happen, so if you want to get a perfect quantum error correction, you have to operate in the lower uh, or the sub Carnot efficiency regime, even though you're allowed technically to operate in the uh, super Carnot efficiency ratio for a heat engine with a feedback control. So that's the thermodynamic statement that we can make in this scenario. So just to summarize, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Um, so as I as I as we discussed, quantum error correction uh, protects your quantum state from a known type of noise. Uh, now, if you take that noise to be a thermal noise specifically, you can uh, do what do what we did here, which is to derive the uh, second law inequality uh, in, more, in a more generalized form than Clausius's formulation. And then we can make a trade-off statement uh, by saying that for sufficiently small temperatures and efficient measurements, you can have the following. So for uh, if you operate in a uh, super car efficiency regime with our quantum error correcting engine, then your fidelity is going to suffer fidelity of their correction. And if, you're, if you want the fidelity of their correction to be perfect, then you have to operate in the sub regime, even though you're technically allowed to operate above them. So um, yeah, and the work is gonna be posted on Archive soon, uh, hopefully within the next two weeks. And yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for listening. All right, great. Thank you, Arshag, for the wonderful talk. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes. I have a question. Um, can you back to the last slide, Arshad? Yep. Yeah, let's, let's, let's go back. Oops. Okay. Yep, there we go. So in information theory, we have something called a strong converse. And what it says is that if you're trying to communicate at a rate faster or, or larger than the capacity of the channel, then the error probability actually converges to one. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very, it gives a very sharp dividing line. Like if you're below capacity, you can make the error probability approach zero. Yeah. And so um, I, don't, I can't remember if in our many discussions we talked about this, but have you thought about this kind of thing? Like, you know, if you're above Carnot, the, the only state, it's a good statement. You, you say that the fidelity cannot be one. It has to be abandoned from away from, abandoned away from one. But is there any, possibility to make a stronger statement where actually in some kind of asymptotic regime, um, the fidelity would approach zero if you're above Carnot? I see. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. It also links to um, things that I've thought of where whereas this uh, trade-off statement can be made uh, even stronger. So mm -hmm. to, uh, to answer your question, Mark, it seems that uh, Doing analysis deeper than this weak, uh, and then this weak trade-off statement mm -hmm. is quite complicated because the inequality that we get is not uh, is not that inviting, so to speak. So, 
Okay. It, I, I haven't, well, first of all, I haven't thought about it the way you said it. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I should, uh, but, but it's even, even, um, even if we try to think about it that way, the inequalities are gonna be quite difficult to work with. So I guess mm -hmm. we'll have to see. All right, thanks. Does anyone else have any questions for Arshad? Can, can you go one slide before, please? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, one more. Uh, um, um, one more? Uh, no, there, there, there. Because uh, I, I am confused by one thing, and maybe you can help me. Uh, you are, you were at the end very happy, or you want to have F E equal one, right? But it is not clear to me how much that condition will tell you about how well your error, uh, uh, quantum error correction machine is. Because you know, imagine the initial state is pure, uh, then Fe is equal to zero. Uh, 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 if the initial state is pure? Right. Um, the initial state is, is, is pure in general because you're purifying it, right? Uh, right, Ivan? Or are you thinking of this initial state? Right, that initial state. That's right. initial. Okay, okay. So let's take it pure. Okay, sure. Then F E is zero, right? Uh, um, not necessarily, because you don't know what you didn't tell me what the final state is. Um, right, yeah. because I want to do this uh, expectation. I want to compute this expectation pattern for which I need the final state. I see. Okay, that, that was my. Okay, that solves right. my my question. Right. Just telling me the initial state is not enough. If, even if it's if even if it, this is pure, it, it simplifies the calculation, but it's not enough. I need to know what the final state is. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any last questions? All right. Well, thank you again, Arshad. Thank you very much.